In part two, we're going to look a little bit more at bromination and then a brief analysis of the formation of explosive peroxides. A short video overall, a big takeaway from part one, knowing those calculations, because we're going to jump back into that again about calculating percent yield. But the first question, right, why, why bother, right? Why would I take an alkane and then put chlorine or bromine on it? Well, doing that, right, if you halogenate an alkane, you can then have a good leaving group, right? We take something that was pretty much non-reactive to begin with, okay? We can only react it with a radical mechanism. But then when you put chlorine or bromine there, you've got a large delta positive on that carbon, okay? Meaning it can act as an electrophile. So if you expose it to a variety of nucleophiles, then you can convert it to a different final compound, right? But there would be no way to directly put a cyano group directly on an alkane, for example. Uh, this situation with cyclopentane would be great because all of the hydrogens are identical, okay? But it's not the best method if you're trying to be selective. If you need to control what carbon that chlorine's going on, for example, you could do something like the addition of HCl to an alkene. That would be much better in terms of selectivity unless you have a carbocation rearrangement to worry about. Okay? But if all you have is an alkane, this is really the only way we have to react it if we want to use another nucleophile later on. Right? Put chlorine or bromine on first. So back into that world of chlorination and bromination, okay? If we're adding bromine, look at these relative rates of bromination for tertiary, secondary, and primary. And again, primary is already always going to be set to a relative reactivity of one, but for a chlorination, we had one to 3.8 to five. And look at this, one to 82 to 1600 when we're dealing with bromine instead of chlorine. Okay, these are specifically at 125C. And that difference is so significant that that reactivity factor really strongly outweighs the probability factor. Okay? Now, probability and reactivity are really important for chlorination. Here, bromination, not so much. Right? Look at this reaction here. And instead of the 71 that split that we saw before, 7129 with chlorine, here taking butane and bromine at 98 to 2. So you see that that reactivity really outweighs the probability, okay? Even though right, that primary hydrogen is more probable, we're only getting 2% one bromobutane, okay? So it's less reactive overall, and that makes it more selective. Let's talk about that a little bit further. Bromine's less reactive and more selective, okay? Which holds for all things, we'll see in just a slide. <clears throat> Let's look at some bond energetics. Okay. Looking at these chlorine initiation steps, oh, sorry, these are chlorine propagation steps, chlorine radical plus your alkene, alkene right, forming another radical. Every one of those is an exothermic reaction. Yep. We can see that from the energetics over here. Bond broken minus the energy of the bond being formed. Negative delta H means it's exothermic. Every one of our chlorinations in that situation is exothermic. And if it's exothermic, um, the Hammond postulate tells us that the transition state looks like the reactants. So there's a small difference in the activation energy going from reactants to transition state. Okay. Now for the bromination, the opposite is true. Okay. These are endothermic reactions. So the transition state looks like the products larger difference in activation energy. And we can see that by looking at the reaction coordinate diagrams as well. Here for our chlorine, right, it's exothermic. In here for our bromine, it's endothermic. So with a greater energy difference there, right, it's harder to overcome. Right? And we want to make it easier for these things to get there. So we know what that's why Right. Any of the tertiary are more stable because it's got a smaller act. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead of slide. Smaller activation energy overall, be it endothermic or exothermic. But the fact that this is endothermic makes that much more significant, which is why we've got one to 82 to 1600 as opposed to one to 3.8 to five. And, and that holds for any type of reaction. Okay? It all boils down to the activation energy. Okay? 
the greater the reactivity of the species, okay, the less selective it will be. So the more reactive, the less selective, or the less reactive, the more selective, however you want to remember it. They're opposite, okay? As reactivity goes up, selectivity goes down. Okay. Chlorine, they're all relatively similar, which is why we get a nice distribution of products. Well, it's not nice if you're designing synthesis, okay? Bromine, less reactive, more selective. It's got more preference for where it's gonna go, okay? Bromine's unreactive and highly selective. So know that as well. Bromination more selective than chlorination. And if you're given, I'm jumping back some slides again, if you're given these numbers, and a product, you should be able to predict, right, here's one you can do for practice, right, the percent yield. So let's continue on. Right? The difference in stability, I just alluded to this with the cyclopentane, right? because chlorination is not that selective overall, right, you really, if you're designing a synthesis, want all the hydrogens to be the same. Okay? Bromination, you can get away with it. 98 to two, that's pretty selective. Yeah, 71, not so great, especially when it's gonna be hard to separate out your products. Okay. So you can go ahead and do a chlorination when all your hydrogens are identical. Again, you always need heat or light. Uh, but if they're not, then bromination is probably gonna be the better way to go. Okay. And again, those are your only two options, chlorination or bromination. Okay. Now fluorine, can it react? Yes, but it's too exothermic to use in the lab overall. Iodine radicals are too unreactive to remove a hydrogen atom. Yep. And it's got some steric hindrance in there, so those guys would just end up coming back together, those iodine radicals. Even if they're formed in solution, they're just gonna come back to one another to form I2. Yep. So fluorine, too violent. Iodine, too unreactive. Think about this being you know, Goldilocks and the three bears. That's too much, that's too little. Get your chlorine and your bromine in the middle that are the ones that react, yep. provided you have heat or light. If you're given an alkene plus Cl2 or Br2, there's no heat or light, no reaction. You've got to have all three. Alkane plus halogen plus heat or light. Okay. Talk for just a second about explosive peroxides, which are really important for lab applications and have some use in synthesis. Okay. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the semester, like the role of these peroxides. And you see these a lot when ethers are exposed to oxygen in air, which is a good thing for those of you that'll continue on in chemistry. You ever see a bottle of ether and it's got white crystals on the cap where it's been possibly exposed? Don't open it, okay? Chances are that thing is explosive. So how do these things actually form? As much as ethers, when they expose, get exposed to light and some oxygen. The reason that these guys form uh, is that we've got peroxides, okay, compounds with OO bonds. Uh, that oxygen-oxygen bond isn't exceptionally stable. It's really e easy to cleave that bond in a homolytic fashion where each one of the oxygens gets one electron. Right? Then you've formed a radical. It was an initiation reaction that can start off a chain reaction that could, can potentially be explosive. Okay? And then this is exactly how it happens. Okay? You've got your radical in solution with an ether. It's gonna react with one of the alpha carbons on your ether. And then that reacts with your peroxide radical there to form your product that's going to pick up another hydrogen to get to the peroxide itself. So that can be a radical chain reaction. List of the steps right here. That's the reason peroxides are radical initiators. They always have to contain a stabilizer. If you're buying any sort of commercial peroxide, it's gonna have something in there to stabilize it. Yeah. You typically purify peroxides before you use them in the lab and you have to use them without a, within a set amount of time, typically 24 hours after purification. Otherwise you risk them turning into an explosive solution. Not as concerned with the mechanism here, more just the fact that you're aware that they exist. Okay, the big takeaways from this video, as I told you, it was a short one, right, we're done here, is this slide right here, know that you can only do chlorine and bromine, 
Know that you want your chlorines to be the same. Know the reactivity selectivity principle, which is what this is called. I don't think I ever used that name. And then know bromination and how to do math and how to calculate numbers like that. Yeah. Short video, cleaning up bromination and chlorination so that in our future videos, we can talk about things like radicals and alkenes coming together.